adventures Dressed in the shoes we know won't fit Riding high amongst the ignorance I'm guessing for the bliss Counting down the days and hours Till we meet again Oh, I'll scream through all these trees Oh, this voice I'll project If you love, don't let it go far We will be the first to wonder Wissahickon is an anglicized version of two Lenape words. And uh, one is Wissok Sicken, and another one was Wissok Micken. And I don't remember which was which, but one was, uh, one was their name for a yellow stream, which refers to the fact that um, there's a yellowish brown soil upstream in Montgomery County, which whenever it would rain or flood, it would bring sediment, that yellowish brown soil down and it would turn the creek from the normal, you know, clear color to a yellowish brown color. The other Lenape name referred to catfish stream, and the stream was apparently crawling with catfish. I don't know, this just doesn't feel like it's in Philadelphia to me. It never really has. And when you're in the park, like, you just can be completely removed from that. You only have to walk through it to, 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 to get a grasp of it. First of all, you're in, you know, you're in a major city and you're coming to some place that I'm sure, you know, short of going to the Rockies, you're gonna find so rugged and so beautiful. We have a lot of mountain bikers, a lot of equestrians, hikers, um, people that, fishers, today is opening day of trout season actually, so you get a lot of fishermen today. And just people who wanna enjoy the outdoors and kind of get away from the city life a little bit. A lot of people don't realize this is actually in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so yeah, I mean, you get a huge variety of people. What I like most about the Wissahickon is that it is an oasis in the city. You've got the hustle and bustle and all the stresses of city life all around it. Yet when you come down here, within just a few minutes, you get away from the city, as most people know it, and you come down here into a wooded gorge with the stream, with all the wildlife, with all the plants, uh, the peacefulness, the solitude. There's kind of this like funky old stone, you know, there's a lot of different like stone walls in the park and not to say that the park isn't pristine, but it's seen a lot of use. There used to be, you know, I think over 30 mills in just this short section of the park. The, the history of the park goes back, of course, millions of years uh, and there were no humans here until about several hundred to several thousand years ago. The Lenape, Native American people, were the first people here. Did very, very little um, e ecological uh, damage. They had a very small footprint on the environment. Uh, they left virtually no trace that they were here. Uh, European colonists got here in the uh, early 1600s, and they started uh, coming up the Schuylkill River to the mouth of the Wissahickon and coming up into the Wissahickon Valley. They built farms, they built uh, water-powered mills and factories, mostly like right along the creek, so that they could use the creek for water power. And then civilization started to expand throughout the Wissahickon, uh, with mostly farming and industrial. Uh, there were approximately 60 working mills right along the creek or the tributaries from um, the 1680s up until the 1880s. And throughout that time period, whatever product they were making or whatever service they were providing was causing a lot of pollution, which just got dumped right into the creek. I think as the area was logged and there was less of a supply of timber, the mill started to shut down, paper production was being moved to other places, or there just wasn't a need for the mills anymore. So a lot of the mills were decommissioned, and this is as the, as the area was being transitioned to a parkland to protect water quality. And in the early days of the park, there was a, a big emphasis on restoration and sustaining uh, what, what they were restoring. And starting in the late 60s, early 70s, that started to slow down. The amount of funding that they put into the preserving the Wissahickon Valley, along with the rest of the Fairmount Park system, it started to stay level. And it is just now being restored after 
40 or so years. The Wissahickon Park is just under 2,000 acres and it has a tremendously high density of trails for a park being 2,000 acres. It sounds like a big number, but there's over 50 miles of trails within this park, which when you compare that to a lot of other parks is e extremely high. Our mission is to preserve and protect the Wissahickon Valley Park and to stimulate public interest therein. For our smaller project work, we do trail construction, which is really our bread and butter. Restoring the trails so they're not contributing to the water quality problems of the Wissahickon. Part of our trail work is also doing habitat restoration. So every time we do a project in the park, we say, okay, you know, where are there opportunities to remove invasives? And also to inform people of these issues and to kind of inspire people to be more passionate about the park and to want to protect the park and the water quality of the Wissahickon. Uh, you know, our estimates are like a million point two people. And if you go to Glacier National Park, that's the kind of usage Glacier National Park gets. This is 12 square miles. I, I look at the Wissahickon first as an ecosystem and second as a place for people to come and enjoy the ecosystem. If it wasn't for the ecosystem, there'd be no reason for people to come here. If you live west of Broad Street in Philadelphia, a lot of your water is coming through either the lower Wissahickon or the lower portion of the Schuylkill River. So it's really important that we protect this area for the water quality. But at the same time, it's, the park sees about a million users a year. So, you know, it's this really fine balance because you can't say, okay, no, no one can go in the park. But what you want to do is figure out how we can manage the park um, so those two things can you know, be harmonious so you can have the environmental benefits and the social, the recreation use. Uh, we're on a two-edged sword for overuse and uh, getting people to attract it to the park because this is a, just a wonderful place, a wonderful place. And, uh, and yet we have people come from all over and it's like your house, you know, there's wear and tear. So there's a certain amount of pollution that goes on and it's compounded by what nature does, which I think is one of the main, main things we've been doing. What nature does is flood and sediment and it affects the usage here. I mean, I guess the way I frame it is when we have heavy weather, it'd be sort of like turning a fire hose on a funnel. You know, it just can't, it just can't absorb it. And so from, from weather event to weather event, the park, is trying to manage it so that we can enjoy the park. And yeah. what do you like to do here? Fish. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. What, I don't eat them. I used to eat them, you know, take a couple and take them home and fry them up. But uh, I don't do that anymore because uh, the Inquirer printed a story about out here, they dumped the radioactive iodine-131. Of course, the iodine-131 goes right to the thyroid. How did you and, feel after reading this? Oh, that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah, I've been telling people up and down here about it. You know, the one guy, he took all his fish off the stringer and threw them in. He took them off and he said, you know why I took them off and threw them back? I said, why? He said, uh, he was having trouble with his thyroid, and he was eating the fish all his, his whole life out of here. So, uh, yeah, I persuaded one guy to, you know, to throw him back, you know, which felt good, you know. But uh, other people I talked to, they just, they don't care, you know. <laughs> I guess because it's not affecting them yet.
The Wissahickon provides a good percentage of Philadelphia's drinking water, so you want it to be clean if we're drinking it. I would say the stormwater is, if not our biggest problem here in the Wissahickon Valley, it's right up there. You know, it is an urban stream, and the water quality is very poor. That's kind of the sad other side of the Wissahickon, is that we have this beautiful stream that when you're down there, you feel like you're, you could be in the middle of Wyoming. But most of the water in the stream is coming, is runoff, coming from the neighborhoods, or it's being discharged from one of four wastewater treatment plants. All the work that's been done in this, you know, in the watershed to improve water quality has really just slowed the deterioration of the water, but I wouldn't say that we're ever seeing any major improvements. The water issues in the Wissahickon uh, are very complex and they're not easily solved. We are working on them, we are making some progress, uh, but they include mostly two things, and that's stormwater runoff and pollution. Well, you get a lot of erosion in the park, so you get a lot of uh, sedimentation in the creek. That really doesn't help um, any sort of life to thrive in the creek. I mean. So sedimentation is when soil or sediment is washed, um, essentially washed away, and that soil is then carried into a water body, in this case, the Wissahickon Creek. The entire 64 square mile, approximately, watershed um, has been heavily impacted by uh, impervious surfaces. And impervious surfaces are any area that water falls and can't re-enter the ground. Houses with roofs, uh, buildings, schools, industry of all kind, parking lots, uh, paved driveways, uh, streets, any kind of impervious surfaces. So in a natural, pristine natural habitat, most creeks, even during big events, are clear. Because most people don't realize this, but most of the water that enters a creek or a river actually flows through the ground. So in the old days, rainwater would come down, it would fall from the sky, percolate down slowly into the ground. Because what happens is water hits these areas, it goes into the soil, and then it moves through the ground and enters, we call it base flow, enters into the bottom of the creek. Now, when water moves through the ground, um, it's naturally filtered because it's being pushed through sand and through soil, and it's really cold when it enters the creek. But um, after you have all those impervious surfaces, there's uh, much less capacity for the water to percolate down into the ground slowly as it should naturally. Water that moves along the surface picks up soil and sediment and any other pollution that's been deposited there like dog waste or lawn fertilizer. The water runs very, very quickly off of the roofs, the downspouts, the gutters, uh, the parking lots, the roads, any kind of impervious surface. The water brings down all kinds of pollutants, whatever's on the ground, especially petroleum products uh, associated with cars. Um, well, pesticides, fertilizers, anything like that goes directly to some kind of storm drain directly into the Wissahickon. So during storms, you're getting this huge sediment load and this huge volume of water entering the creeks. And normally it would take a lot longer for those creeks to fill up. But now during storms, the, the level of the creek is just up and then down really quickly. It does erosion and flooding damage and, um, and of course the pollution. And then as soon as the storm is over, then the water recedes, leaves a lot of siltation behind, which still has some of the pollution in it. And it's really dirty water. And sedimentation is really bad for any, you know, like plants or fish that are living in the creek because it blocks out all the sunlight, the fish can't see to swim, and then you're also getting these big nutrient and pollution loads at the same time. Our major program that addresses erosion and stormwater runoff is STI, the Sustainable Trails Initiative. The Sustainable Trails Initiative was created in response to you know, what had become a pretty deteriorated trail system. As an organization, we want to do something about this. So we've teamed up with Parks and Rec and uh, Philadelphia Water Department to do a park-wide master plan, essentially trails master plan for the park, where we identified all the trails in the park and we got recommendations on whether we should close them, whether we should reroute them, whether they can be maintained, you know, with changes. So really, the focus of STI has become to eliminate unnecessary damaged or poorly designed trails and replace them with more sustainable trails that can better resist erosion and have less maintenance. We do trail building, uh, sometimes build new trails, sometimes repair existing trails, sometimes close uh, rogue trails or unsustainable trails. Annually we do about 10 miles of trail maintenance 
Now, a lot of this is recurring maintenance that you have to do year to year. We uh, build fences, we pick up trash and litter, uh, do creek cleanups, and a little bit of everything. We've um, raised money working with the city to have an environmental engineering firm come out and build what are essentially a series of stepped rock pools. And those rock pools act to dissipate um, some of the energy from that stormwater that's coming in, as well as um, give that water a chance to re-infiltrate into the ground and essentially mitigate any further erosion because rock doesn't erode. The Trail Ambassador Program kind of came out of STI. Uh, and that is really to reach out to people and let them know about the Wissahickon and what's going on in the Wissahickon. Uh, the official term is a docent program and basically where you're supposed to interrelate with people uh, who are using the park to try and make the park a more enjoyable experience. And their whole role is just to be in the park and to talk to people in the park, about the park, about how to use the trails, about the work that we do. Our volunteer program is bigger than it's ever been. Uh, last year I served over uh, 2,500 volunteers and uh, we had uh, about 7,000 hours in volunteer service down here. But most of our projects are designed in a way that you know, I'll do the planning on the project and I'll work with maybe a trail designer or a trail builder, but really just local people from the neighborhoods are the ones out there building it. And um, last year, I think it was a big milestone for us. We had 10,000 volunteer hours, which is just huge. If you equate that into a dollar amount, I mean, it's, it's unfathomable, that level of investment. You know, we really wouldn't be where we are without our volunteers. A lot of the things uh, that will help uh, control the stormwater and pollution issues are not things that government has to do. A lot of it is just education and asking private owners to just be more environmentally responsible. When we teach people that kind of responsibility, then hopefully they will come forward and do it on their own and that will help control a lot of the, the stormwater runoff and pollution issues. I think the future is bright for the park. I think it's brighter than ever for a number of reasons. Friends of the Wissahickon are bigger, um, have raised more money, have hired more staff, uh, have increased their membership, have increased their outreach and their influence. They're able to advocate better on behalf of the Wissahickon Valley than ever before and they physically get a lot of work done. I think there's just a heightened awareness anymore about uh, the fact that certain chemicals and certain materials and certain human practices really have a negative impact on the environment and people want this place to be clean. They want it to be safe. They want it to be a, a nature habitat where they can come down and, and get away from the rest of the world. And there's more and more people that are aware of what they can do to help influence that. So I would say you put all those factors together and the future is bright for the Wissahickon.